So this evening we welcome uh, Dr. Ashley Kenny. So Ashley is a research fellow at the Natural History Museum in London and a research scholar at the University of Chicago. He holds a uh, Master of Nerve Science and a PhD from the University of Manchester here in the United Kingdom. His research aims to understand how formation of the solar system, how it evolved from, uh, from a cloud of gas and dust to the sun planets, asteroids, and the comets we see today. To achieve this, he uses a range of analytical techniques to investigate the bulk to nanoscale mini mineralogical, chemical, isotopic properties of primitive meteorites and samples returned by spacecraft from asteroids and comets. In particular, he notes that he, his interests include extrasolar and solar dust in the protoplanetary disk, low and high temperature uh, alteration of meteorites, and the relationship between meteorites, asteroids, and comets. To date, he has contributed to 192 publications and has been cited 1,921 times. He has recently contributed to the article uh, Asteroid uh, Bennett in the laboratory properties of the sample collected uh, by Osiris. This relates to uh, NASA's Osiris uh, mission that dropped a capsule to Earth containing 120 grams of pristine carbonaceous um, regolith of uh, venom. The article describes uh, the delivery and the initial allocation of this asteroid sample and, in, and introduces bulk physical, chemical, and mineralogical properties from the early analysis to date. So, with that being said, could we please provide uh, Dr. Ashley King a warm expert in Swinton Astronomical Society welcome? <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. That was an amazing introduction. <laughs> Clearly done your research. Um, yeah, so so thanks for uh, having me this evening and thanks for those who are in the room and those who are uh, joining online. Um, yeah, as you just heard, I work down at the Natural History Museum in London and uh, it sounds like an impressive list of things that I do, but I actually I just measure bits of space rock in the lab and try and use them to learn about how our solar system formed. Uh, and I do that using lots of different analytical techniques and doing lots of different um, uh, kind of extraterrestrial materials. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, as you just heard, was is the um, the samples that recently came by. I say recently, but last September. So, so we're not far off of a, a year now since these samples have been back. Um, but these were collected by this mission, a NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx, that went to this asteroid called Bennu, um, scooped up 121 grams, um, delivered them back to us here on Earth. And we've spent most of the last year very busily trying to characterize these using a whole series of X-rays and lasers and electron beams and things. And so what hopefully I can tell you about over the next sort of 40 minutes or so is, is why we went to do this mission, some of the work that we've been doing and what we're hoping to find um, from studying these samples. So I always uh, like to kick off these talks by showing this picture here in the, in the top corner. Um, this is a system, you may have seen this before, it's just a slightly uh, out of date picture now, um, but this is a, a system called HL Tau um, that was one of the first protoplanetary disks that was imaged by the ALMA telescope when it came online. Um, and when I say protoplanetary disk, what I mean is uh, you have a central star that's forming in the middle and you're surrounded by this, this kind of flattened disk of gas and dust um, and that's where planets form. And, 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 and so that's how our own solar system started off about four and a half billion years ago. And, and things like ALMA and, and things like JWST are now allowing us to, to look at these protoplanetary disks and actually see what was going on um, when solar systems are forming right at the birth of the solar system, right at that starting point. So HL Tau, for example, is about 450 light years away. And the central star is only maybe only 100,000 years, maybe not even that old. So you're really at time zero for this solar system. Uh, and what you can hopefully see in the image of these dark rings, so the bright stuff is is, is gas and dust that's um, that's emitting, um, is being picked up by the ALMA telescope. And then you have the, the dark rings. And this is where we think that, that some of that gas and some of that dust is actually accreting together to start making asteroids. And those asteroids start accreting together to start making planet-sized bodies. So we're almost at the point now of our telescopes that we can kind of watch solar systems um, forming, which is absolutely amazing. 
Um, just to give you an idea, though, I'm, I'm not an astronomer at all. I'm a, I'm a geologist by training. I like studying rocks. I like looking at rocks and trying to, to work out what they can tell us about um, the origins of Earth and the origins of the solar system. And so if you compare HL Tau to our own solar system, um, this kind of dark ring here is probably not too dissimilar to the orbit of Pluto in our solar system. And when we look at our solar system, we know that the inner solar system has four rocky inner planets, and then the outer solar system has the gas and the ice giants. Um, and that's all, if we look comparing that to HL Tau, that would all be within this region here, where we just still don't have the resolution with our telescopes. So if we want to learn about how we end up with a solar system that looks like ours and, and how our solar system formed, we really need to go out into our solar system and actually look at the planets, look at the asteroids, um, look at the moons that are there, use the materials that are available to us to try and reconstruct the origins of our solar system. So that's really kind of all my research is, is, is trying to use extraterrestrial materials to understand how you go from a, a protoplanetary disk like this to a solar system that looks a bit like this. And, and the real key um, to, to unraveling the history of the solar system are the asteroids. And the asteroids really are the, the building blocks of our solar system. Everything starts off as gas and dust, and that dust creates together, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you get to meter, maybe kilometer-sized bodies, um, and that's what we call asteroids. Some of those asteroids obviously are created together to make hundreds of kilometer-sized bodies or thousands of kilometer-sized bodies, which is what we call planets. Um, but the stuff that didn't go into the planets, the stuff that's kind of still out there, those small bodies... Um, those asteroids uh, basically have remained unchanged for the last four and a half billion years. Nothing's happened to them. They accreted together, a few impacts into the surface and things, but essentially their composition, their mineralogy, um, their structure really hasn't changed for four and a half billion years. And so they are kind of like a time capsule for us. They take us all the way back to the start of our solar system. So we mainly find asteroids in the main asteroid belt. So that's that belt of material between um, the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. We also have a population of near-Earth asteroids. So these are ones that have been kicked in cl much closer to Earth. They have orbits that are very, very similar to Earth going around the Sun. Uh, and then you also have a population of things called the Jupiter Trojans, and they have that, uh, orbits that are very similar to Jupiter. Uh, and we know probably um, we have some information. So either kind of we know how dark they are or their size or their orbit um, for about a million or so asteroids, 900,000, a million or so. There are many more asteroids out there, um, we know. Um, but we have some kind of characteristic um, or some sort of information about for about a million. And of those that million or so asteroids, um, about 75% of them are really, really dark. They just don't reflect very much sunlight off of their surface. And so that's led to them being called uh, carbonaceous or C-type asteroids. So, so the vast majority of the asteroids we see in the solar system are this really dark carbonaceous type. And one of the reasons we think they're so dark is that they likely contain carbon mixed into the um, into the minerals on their surface. They probably also, at least some of them, contain some water. So this isn't water kind of slushing around. It's not liquid water within these asteroids. It's probably um, OH and H2O bound within uh, the, the minerals that are actually there on the surface. So the fact that you have carbon and the fact that you have water, these are, these are what we call volatile species. And so these must have formed in the outer part of the solar system where temperatures were much colder. So you had things like ice um, and you had you had water ice, you probably had carbon dioxide ice, maybe even ammonia ice actually within the disk, within the materials from which the asteroids were accreting from. So we think carbonaceous, these C-type asteroids are samples of our outer solar system. They didn't get very big. They didn't get heated up either internally through radiogenic decay or by the sun. And so really their, their chemistry, their composition is, is what we call primitive. It hasn't changed for four and a half billion years. So we have these, these kind of carbonaceous asteroids that are completely primitive. Nothing's happened to them. They tell us what was there when the solar system was forming right at the start, four and a half billion years ago. And they probably also contain some carbon. They probably also contain some water. And this is really exciting because they can maybe help us explain why we have oceans here on the Earth and can, can potentially help us explain why we have carbon-rich organic-type materials being delivered to the early Earth. And, and one of the ways we think we can get them from the outer solar system to the inner solar system is through this idea of giant planet migration. So in recent years, well, we used to think the solar system was a very static environment four and a half billion years ago. Uh, and in recent years, um, largely due to the discovery of exoplanets and things like hot Jupiters, um, there's been this idea to develop that actually Jupiter and Saturn within our own protoplanetary disk migrated around in the disk. 
Um, and in, by doing that, they actually kicked a lot of these asteroids that formed in the outer solar system inwards. And so that gives us a mechanism for, for taking these bodies and delivering these volatile species like water and carbon to, to places like the Earth and, and also the other rocky um, inner planets. So carbonaceous asteroids, really crucial to understanding the history of the solar system uh, and, and the origins of, of life and water on Earth. Excuse me. So one of the ways that we can um, uh, study carbonaceous asteroids, and the ways we, we normally typically do this, is by using uh, what we call carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. So we have uh, about 70,000 meteorites in our worldwide meteorite collections, meteorites being bits of rock that come to us from, from space and from rocky bodies out there in the solar system. Um, at the Natural History Museum, we have the UK's national collection of meteorites. We only have about 5,000 pieces, so about 2,000 meteorites. So it's not the world's largest collection, but it's historically um, one of the most important, probably the world's oldest meteorite collection. And of that 70,000 or so meteorites, about 5% of them are carbonaceous chondrite type meteorites. So they're, they're meteorites that we think are coming from these carbonaceous asteroids. They're very, very dark when you see them in hand specimens. This is what we can see here in this picture. So these meteorites are really, really rare. Um, for most meteorites, we don't know they're coming in. We, we can't predict them. They just come through, they land. Um, and so we have no information about whereabouts in the solar system they came from. We have no what we call geological context. And so as a geologist, I always want to have a rock and I can tell you a lot about how that rock formed. I can tell you what its mineral are, minerals are. I can tell you a bit about its composition. Without knowing how that rock fits into all the other rocks that were forming near it, I really don't have the full picture of how that, um, how that rock was forming. And so that's very much what it's like for our meteorite collection we have these 70,000 meteorites, but we just don't know whereabouts most of them are coming from in our solar system. So we have some of the story, but not the complete picture. Um, the other big problem with carbonaceous chondrites is that, uh, well, well, all meteorites, is that they all come through the atmosphere uh, and they will react with the atmosphere and become modified very, very quickly. And particularly carbonaceous chondrites, they are very susceptible um, to terrestrial alteration. And if you're interested in things like water and what the composition of that water is and how much water is locked up within these samples, and you're interested in things like organics, that's a big problem. We're always struggling with our meteorite record to understand what signatures are coming from the extraterrestrial rock and what signatures are overprinting from the terrestrial environment. So this is a big problem. We absolutely love meteorites. We spend most of our time studying meteorites. Um, they're really, really crucial resource, but they're not absolutely ideal samples. Um, for, for learning about the early solar system. Excuse me. We do have one way we can improve that. And you may have seen this, these are actually pictures of the Winchcombe meteorite that landed in the UK um, in February 2021. Um, this was a carbonaceous chondrite. And we actually we have a network of cameras out there in the UK that record the fireball as this, as this came through the atmosphere. And by doing that, it allows us to, to calculate the orbit of the rock. Um, so that's what's shown on this plot here, this, this red um, line. This is a bit noisy, I'm afraid, but this red line shows the orbit of Winchcombe. So we know, we don't know exactly which asteroid it came from, but we know that it came from somewhere towards the outer part of the main asteroid belt. So we have a little bit of context for the Winchcombe meteorite. And we hope we only have these orbits um, for about 40 or so of those 70,000 meteorites that we have in our collections. So this is really rare to, to, to get this. The other thing we can do when we have uh, the fireball cameras um, is actually track the trajectory through the atmosphere. Uh, we can calculate or estimate where any meteorites might have landed on the ground. And for Winchcombe, we, we were very successful in doing that. And it meant that the first materials were collected probably only about 12 hours after landing in the UK. So that's really, really quick. Other than it landing on my desk at the Natural History Museum, we couldn't have got that rock any quicker. And that means that we can really minimize the amount of terrestrial contamination. So, so Winchcombe is a, is a really special sample. Not perfect, um, but a really special sample for us to learn about the early solar system. So the other way we can get carbonaceous asteroid samples is by actually building a spacecraft, going there, grabbing the sample and bringing it back to Earth. This is not straightforward. Uh, it takes many, many years of writing proposals and asking governments and space agencies for money. It's not cheap. Um, it takes a long time. It's difficult. Um, no guarantees it's always going to work. And so sample return is not something we get to do very often, but it's absolutely crucial because it offers us a way of getting information that we can't get from our, our meteorite record. So in particular, it gives us context for the geology. Um, we can go to a known carbonaceous asteroid um, or anywhere in the solar system, uh, we can collect the rocks and we can put those rocks into context with all the other information we have about that body. 
We can ground truth remote observations. So we um, remote observations is when we're looking at stuff in space with spacecraft or with telescopes, um, but we always have some uncertainty there. And if we can actually do the measurements with the spacecraft and then grab the same rock, bring it back and study it in the laboratory, we can actually see how our remote observations compare to our laboratory observations. And that allows us to interpret bigger data sets than we, than we can at the moment. We can do really complex measurements. So we've got a whole load of things, for example, driving around on the surface of Mars, and they've got instruments and analytical techniques on there, and they do amazing work. Um, but in the lab, we can almost pick these samples apart atom by atom. And, and, and at the minute, you just can't build an instrument that you can fly on a spacecraft. You know, it just becomes too too expensive. The instruments uh, the instruments are too big, um, too complicated to put on a spacecraft. But we can do that. If you bring the sample back to Earth, we can do really complex measurements. And then we get these really pristine materials. So Winchcombe really is pretty much as fresh as we're going to get for a carbonaceous chondrite, but it still had to come through our atmosphere. It still starts to react. As soon as it hits the top of the atmosphere, it's modified um, by our environment. When we have a, a sample return mission, we're able to preserve that. We can we can bring them back in a controlled way um, so we, they don't see the atmosphere as, they, as they're traveling through it. Um, and then we can store and curate these things um, under inert conditions, basically. So they're never seeing the terrestrial environment. So this is our glove box. Um, this is filled up with nitrogen gas, um, which doesn't react with anything. And so this is where we store all our carbonaceous meteorites at the, at the Natural History Museum and, and, and also our sample return um, samples. And then the other really important thing that people sometimes don't think about for, for sample return missions is that we actually we want to do science. We want to... Uh, study these samples that involves destroying some of them. We consume some of the some of the samples as we do these analysis, um, but we also curate and look after samples. Uh, and and one of the reasons we do that is because in 10, 20, 30 years, people will have completely new ideas about how the solar system formed or new questions they want to answer, and they'll have analytical techniques that are more sensitive or have higher resolution than we can even imagine today. Um, so it's a really important part of sample return is is we do a lot of fun science for the next few years. But in 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, there'll be a whole new generation of people who can study the same samples. Um, and a really good example of this has been the Apollo samples that came back from the moon in sort of the 60s and 70s. Uh, and originally they were thought to be completely dry, just, just had no water in them at all. And then sort of maybe 10, 20 years ago, as, as, as new instruments were built, um, they were much more sensitive. They actually found out that these lunar samples have not loads of water, but much more water than they, they previously thought. Uh, and that's been confirmed now by follow-up studies and by the rovers and orbiters um, working on the moon. So it's so really important that, that you, you curate and you look after those samples. And those Apollo samples are still being studied um, today. Okay, so that moves me on to OSIRIS-REx. Um, so this was the, the NASA mission um, to go to a carbonaceous asteroid, the asteroid called Bennu, um, collect samples, characterize the asteroid and collect samples uh, and bring them back to Earth. And, and that's what we've been working on for the last year or so. Um, so OSIRIS is, is put together um, uh, through this acronym. So, so o, o is for origins. Um, so basically these are the starting point, the starting composition of our solar system. Spectral interpretation, um, that's that ground truthing. So the spacecraft had a whole load of spectrometers on that characterized the composition of the surface. And we're now testing those measurements by doing direct uh, analysis of those return samples. Um, resource identification. Bennu is a, a hydrated, I don't think it's a secret, but it, it contains water-rich minerals. Um, and so there are people and, and companies who are interested in mining things like or places like Bennu because you can use the hydrogen for, for making water or for making fuel for doing um, deep space um, exploration. So there is an interest in that. Security. And this is because Bennu has a, I can't remember the exact number now, but um, has a very small chance of that it could impact um, the Earth um, in the next few thousand years or so um, is a very, very tiny chance. Uh, it has been classified the 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 um, the most dangerous asteroid um, out there, or the highest risk to the Earth. Um, and so, what we really don't know, we can study meteorites, but we actually don't know that the kind of physical structure and the physical properties of asteroids particularly well. We, we've only really visited a handful of so. So, security, you know. If, if Bennu was going to hit the Earth, we want to learn about what it's made of, what its structure is, so that we can plan for how you might stop at an event like that. And then Regolith Explorer, because the regolith is that material on the surface of an asteroid or an airless body, and that's what we were characterizing. We're not looking at the interior so much, um, and that's where the sample came back from. So OSIRIS-REx, it was many years of, of planning and, as I said, getting funding together. Um, these often don't get funded on the first um, proposal. It takes a lot of time. 
Um, it takes a lot of persistence and nagging people as well. Uh, but it eventually it launched in 20, September 2016 from Florida. Um, it made its journey out. So Bennu is a, is a near-Earth asteroid. It's one of these ones, not in the main asteroid belt. Um, it's on an orbit that's very similar um, to the Earth. So it's not so far away, um, but it still took two years um, for OSIRIS-REx to catch up with it and actually make its journey uh, and reach Bennu. It then spent um, just over three years or so at the surface or in orbit around um, Bennu, characterizing the surface, collecting the sample. Uh, it left Bennu in 2021 and it arrived back on Earth with its sample in September last year. So all in all, about a seven, seven year mission. So these things don't happen quickly. Now, this is a pretty quick mission <laughs> so compared to some. So, um, so this is the arrival. Um, this is this is as the Cyrus Rex was getting closer and closer to the Bennu. So you sort of let it run again. Um, you can see that basically goes from one fuzzy pixel to to uh, tens of fuzzy pixels. And then I can show you Bennu in all its glory. Um, so this is the the up close um, image uh, of the surface of Bennu. First thing, so it's very small. It's only about 500 meters or so across. It doesn't have any atmosphere. Um, it's what we call an airless body. It really doesn't have any gravity um, at all. So you, this is a very different environment to say working on Mars. You know, people always ask, or you know, we put things in orbit around Mars. We land things on Mars and drive rovers around. Um, we do that fairly regularly and pretty successfully these days. Um, this is a completely different environment. No atmosphere and uh, no gravity, so you can't really put a rover on the surface and drive it around. It's, it's very, very difficult. It also spins around, uh, it takes it about four hours or so to make a complete um, rotation. So it spins pretty quick. So this isn't an easy an easy environment to be, to be working in. You'll see it has that kind of what we call a diamond. Um, so it's sometimes been called the baseball diamond shape. Uh, and this is probably because it because it's rotating the the the, the <laughs> everything's pushing out towards the um towards the middle and we see this shape fairly commonly in asteroids that we've seen and then the other thing is so the whole osiris Rex mission was kind of designed um thinking that the the surface of this asteroid and this was an asteroid that was characterized by using space telescopes and telescopes on earth um fairly significantly much more than we do for most cat, um, asteroids because we wanted to learn as much as we could before the osiris Rex mission got there um, and so the idea before Osiris Rex arrived was that this was going to be a bit like a beach, that the, the surface was just going to be kind of a sandy beach. Um, there weren't going to be any kind of impact craters so much. There weren't really going to be any huge boulders or anything. Um, and so that's the kind of environment that we, we were going to, be, going to be working in and the type of material that we were going to be sampling. Uh, and they got there and the surface is absolutely covered in boulders. Um, they're huge things. This is tens of meters in size, some of these boulders. It's barely hanging on. There's not really any gravity um, as it spins around. This was pretty terrifying for the spacecraft team because um, boulders, particularly when you want to get down on the surface and grab some sample, boulders are a risk to your spacecraft. And so um, there was a, a very <clears throat> long process of identifying regions where the that were scientifically interesting um, places to collect a sample from, but also you were going to be going to be able to collect a sample without damaging your spacecraft. Um, there's no point sending the spacecraft there crashing it into the surface or hitting a big boulder so that you never get any sample back. So, um, so this threw up a whole load of challenges for the kind of um, engineering team. So this is it rotating around. Um, so the albedo, it's, it doesn't look it in this image, but it's very, very dark. It's one of the darkest objects in the solar system. The albedo is a few percent or so. Um, they can estimate things like density and porosity. So it's very low density. Um, very high porosity, probably 60, 70%. So this is not a, a lithified rock. This isn't a solid piece of rock. Um, this has a lot of pore space with inside it. Uh, and why? one of the reasons we think that is, is it's what we call a, a rubble pile asteroid. So while, rather than being that kind of one kind of lump of, of rock orbiting out there in space, this is actually lots of fragments of rock that have kind of accreted back together and are being weakly held um, together by, by gravity. And so we think actually in the early solar system, there was a whole generation of kind of bigger asteroids that have been smashed up over time. And those fragments have then reaccumulated into what we call asteroid families. And these, these are mainly asteroids or groups of asteroids that have these rubble pile structures a bit like this. So this is, I guess we've come to the idea of this is a second generation asteroid. Um, so it, Bennu has a parent body that was much bigger, broke up, um, and then it's reaccumulated to make this. So a few things that happened whilst we were there and as the spacecraft was um, um, actually at Bennu. I think this happened maybe within the first few days or so of, of, of OSIRIS-REx arriving. 
Um, so hopefully it's not entirely or really clear, but hopefully you can see there's some brighter. This is this is the surface of Bennu, but there are some brighter pixels kind of scattered off over here. But yeah, and the, the real big surprise here was that, that that Bennu was was kind of active. It was doing something. Material was being ejected off the surface, not in a continuous flow, but from time to time it would kind of spurt out all these kind of centimeter um, sized particles from its surface, and that's really interesting because in sort of planetary science we've always had this. Uh, um, idea that you have asteroids that are, that are rocky, and then you have comets and, and don't really do anything and, and are really active, you know, geologically inactive bodies, and, and then you have comets which are, are mainly icy and they have some dust in them. And as they go around the sun, they get heated up and the sublimation, and you get those really spectacular tails. And so comets have, you know, they're, they're primitive objects, but they have some activity to them as, as they're traveling around the solar system. Um, and so what we're starting to find is that the more and more of our asteroids that we look at um, are actually active, maybe not as active as a comet, but they do show some activity. And so there's maybe a blurring of the lines between exactly what a comet is and, and exactly what a, an asteroid is. Um, so this was really amazing. We weren't expecting to see anything like this at all. Uh, one of the reasons this could be happening is, is Bennu is not on a perfectly circular orbit. It's nowhere near as elliptical, um, let's say, a comet is. Um, so they, they go out very far and then they come in very close to the sun. Um, so, so Bennu doesn't do that, but it does have periods when it's slightly closer to the sun and it has periods when it's slightly further away. And so that can cause kind of thermal fatigue of the rocks. So it's a bit like you imagine in a desert when they heat up during the day and they cool down at night. And so that can break some of those rocks. And that might be what we're seeing here is this thermal fatigue and this kind of rejection of material. Could also be um, micrometeorites, so small bits, so not, not big chunks of rock, but, but small particles impacting into the surface and kind of dislodging material. So we don't know exactly what, what's going on there, but, but there clearly was some kind of geological activity happening on Benny that we weren't expecting to see. Um, OSIRIS-REx, it's not the first asteroid mission. It's not even the first asteroid sample return mission. Um, JAXA have done this twice before um, with the uh, Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2. But OSIRIS-REx was the first um, uh, and only, so far, uh, mission to go into orbit uh, around an asteroid. And as I said, these are small bodies, no gravity. This is not, um, the other missions generally fly alongside as they go around uh, asteroids and comets as they go around the sun. Um, OSIRIS-REx actually went into a, a full orbit for periods um, of time. And um, what that allowed it to do was collect, using its spectrometers and its instruments, it collected the first kind of full geological map of the surface of, of an asteroid. Um, so this is what it is. It doesn't look too spectacular um, or without boring you of all the details of this. But, but basically, the, the surface is very homogenous. Um, the, the albedo is the same. The brightness is the same all over the surface. Um, there are some very, very subtle changes between um, in some areas between between the, the kind of spectra and the reflectance that we see off the surface. And so that's allowed the team to, to kind of divide it into two geological units. So we have the, the unit that's kind of a bit redder and, and they call that the smooth unit. Uh, and then they have the unit that's a bit bluer and they call that the rugged unit. So there is a little bit of geology in there. But this is maybe not as diverse as, as you might see, say, if you go and visit um, you know, regions in the UK or, or other kind of geologically active places on, on Earth and things. But but what's interesting is we can go and say, right, we're going to grab samples from there. And we know that we're looking at, say, the red unit or we know that we're looking at the, at the blue unit. And that's really interesting and important for us for understanding the, the context of the Bennu samples. Um, the main thing. So one of the reasons that that that, uh, that Benny was chosen is it's a it's a it's a hazardous asteroid, um, but also it's very dark, so it was expected to contain carbon uh, and organic bearing phases, uh, and it also had evidence of having um, water locked up in its surface minerals. So the Osiris Rex spacecraft, one of the first measurements it did was to actually see if it could detect that water, um, and that's what's shown here on this this plot. So this is what we call, um, this is the reflectance spectra. So we're looking at the light that's bouncing back off the surface of, of Bennu. Um, and, and this is the three micron um, feature or the three micron region. So Bennu is this kind of light blue, slightly noisy line here. And we get this little bump here at about three microns in wavelength. Uh, and that's related to the presence of OH and H2O. So this is, this is water locked up within the minerals on the surface of Bennu. So this is exactly what the team wanted to see this confirmed that we got the right sort of asteroid we were likely to get water bearing minerals uh, just for comparison this is the green and the orange and the red these are um, spectra collected um, in the laboratory on earth of different carbonaceous type meteorites so you can see they also show this three micron type feature but that feature is much bigger or much deeper um, in these meteorites 
And at least part of the reason for that is because they've been on the trash on the on the earth and they've absorbed the atmosphere. They're basically like a sponge. They suck up all the water out of the trash environment. So it shows you this is this is an asteroid that hasn't seen the trash environment compared to some meteorites. Um, and they see that three micron feature everywhere on Bennu. Um, the surface is, is the minerals are, are full of water. The other thing that they detected every now and again, you find these bright things that look a bit like veins. This is sort of tens of centimeters up to maybe about a meter or so in size. Uh, and again, we can look at how the spectra, uh, the, um, uh, the features in the spectra that are coming back off of these. And, and these are very consistent with what we call carbonate minerals. So, so things calcium and, and magnesium bound with, with carbon and oxygen. Um, and this is very similar to, carbonates are very common on earth. Um, they're very similar to the type of things, you know, if you get lime scale and stuff in your kettle or on your shower head and stuff, they're, they're carbonate minerals or, um, and yeah, things like limestone as well. Um, uh, yeah, these are all same sort of minerals that you're seeing in those is what we're seeing on these asteroids. Uh, and these formed through through hydrothermal systems. So these are evidence, particularly the veins, of evidence that, that water was flowing probably on, Bern, on, Bennu, on Bennu's parent asteroid um, really early on in the solar system. So again, we have these minerals that have OH and H2O locked up in them. Um, we call these clay-like minerals. They're a bit like muds here on the Earth. And we have these carbonates that again point towards this kind of water rock reactions going on on Bennu's parent body in the early solar system. We also saw, not so common, but there are a few boulders that are quite bright or much, much brighter um, than, than, the, the, than the rest of the surface. Um, and these have spectra that are very, very similar to spectra that have been collected off of Vesta, which is one of the largest bodies in the main asteroid belt. And, and Vesta is an interesting body because it, it was a bigger asteroid. It probably melted and differentiated out into and layers, and it has kind of basalts and a, probably a, a kind of rocky and iron-rich mantle and, and probably a core um, and there seem to be bits of Vesta that have been mixed into the surface of Bennu. So this is telling us that the early asteroid was really chaotic. Stuff was smashing into each other. Bits of asteroid were flying around, and being mixed into the regolith of other bodies in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the asteroid belt. So really interesting. We haven't found any of this yet in the return samples, but it's still very early days. And we're hoping, we, we call this xenoliths. This is, this is material that we think didn't form on that body, but has been mixed in at a later point. Okay, so onto the sample section. As I said, it was quite a long process and, and to, to pick this out. Uh, finally, they settled on um, this area that's called Nightingale. So this is within this crater here. Uh, this was selected because the area here is very, very, it doesn't, can't quite tell on here, but the area in, in, in here is, is pretty fine grained compared to the big boulders. So they thought they could land here and collect samples quite easily um, or, excuse me, with less risk of hitting um, the boulders than, than most other places on the surface. Uh, and the materials in here are also darker, uh, just subtly, but a little bit darker than the rest of the surface. And so that pointed to them being more enriched in, in carbon. Um, so this is where they decided to go for. This is on the northern hemisphere of, of Bennu. Uh, and this is the sample um, collection itself. So this is called... Um, the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism. So this is the TAGSAM. Um, so basically the spacecraft has a has an arm that, that comes out uh, it's about two or three meters or so in length that extends out from the spacecraft. And on the end of that, you have this kind of head, this TAGSAM head. This is about 30 centimeters or so across. Um, and this is the thing that actually made contact with the asteroid surface. So the spacecraft didn't land and scoop up material. It had this arm that touched down um, and the taxon kind of worked a little bit like a, a backwards hoover. It, it touched the surface and it fired gas into the surface and that kicked the material up inside into the into the head, which I'll show you just in just a second. Okay, and you can see here in the video, it makes a big mess, it throws material everywhere. Um, so it kind of did that, uh, it backed away. Um, and then what they discovered when they put the camera on and had a look at this, this is the taxon, this is the surface that actually touched the, the, touched the asteroid um, so along here, these are, these are contact pads. These are like little fibers, and they were designed to pick up kind of little millimeter particles right off the surface of the of the regolith. And then the stuff. This is the inside chamber of the tag tam. Um, so most of the sample was supposed to come from just below the surface and be pushed up um, with into this into this um, into this kind of collection head here. It's not so clear on this picture, but I'll, I'll show another one in just a second. What they discovered um, when they did it is that you, you can't see it in here, but there's kind of um, uh, well, the word escapes me. There's kind of a, um, can't think what the word is. Anyway, my brain's gone to sleep, sorry. Um, but anyway, there's a there's a particle wedged in here that's leaving the, the, the collector head slightly ajar. And so all this material was flowing out of the tag sound. 
um, when they backed away from the spacecraft. And so they had to make a decision very quickly to actually, they could close the arm up, they could put that tag sound into what they call the sample return capsule, the thing that came back through the atmosphere and stop any more loss of material. So this was, everything went really smoothly with this collection until they got to this point and they could see this particle had been wedged um, underneath. Oop, I'm going through. Oh, my computer's gone to sleep now. Same as my brain. Give it a second. There we go. Okay, so yes, that got closed, um, uh, put into the sample return capsule, and then it left uh, Bernou on, in 2021. And so on the 24th of September last year, um, OSIRIS-REx didn't actually come back to the Earth itself. It's, it's gone on to another mission um, to go and view uh, Apophis, so not a sample return mission, but it's going to go and characterize the asteroid Apophis in 2029, I think it is. Um, but as it flew past the Earth, it actually dropped the sample return capsule off. So this is what you can see here. This is the sample return capsule being dropped off by the osiris -X spacecraft. And this limb here is the Earth. So this was just last end of September last year. Uh, and that thing basically came hurtling back towards the Earth. Uh, and then it came through our atmosphere early in the morning. Um, so it comes in, it's a little bit like a meteorite or a meteor, so it produces a fireball. It was daytime, so it was not so easy to, to see that fireball. Uh, and then it has a whole series of parachutes to slow it down. And then this is the sample return capsule just hanging off of here. So you can see it's swinging around a little bit, um, but it came down pretty smoothly. You can't see it as it lands, but hopefully you'll be able to tell in just a second when it's made contact with the air. So there you go. It's landed down perfectly. So this was all went pretty much according to plan. Um, it landed in the Utah uh, desert. So it's basically a US um, army um, or air force site. So nobody can go there. It's completely closed off to everybody. It's a big desert. Um, it's very, it's pretty flat. Um, uh, and the army can actually, they have a whole load of helicopters and things on, on looking out for the fireball as it comes through and then being able to get the team out there as quickly as possible to recover those samples. So that all went pretty smoothly. Um, this is just the most, beautiful picture i think um this is the sample return capsule just sat in the utah desert uh so you can see the capsule itself has a really black color that's kind of like the charring so this is very similar to when we get a fusion crust that the outer layers kind of get heated up and, and cooked a little bit as they come through the atmosphere uh, and this is exactly how it landed so there was a chance this thing was going to roll around and move and, and, and do all sorts of stuff and, and it actually just landed perfectly um like this uh, didn't land on a bush, didn't land as lots of um, unused landmines and things in here because it's a, a training range. Um, didn't hit any of those, fortunately. Didn't land in any puddles. Uh, there's, you can't see it in this picture, but there's a road that's very close by. So it was, you couldn't have picked a better spot um, uh, for this to have landed. And they did, they'd did. they done several trips out there and several test exercises to, to do this, to count for all the worst possible things that could happen. Um, but it was it was it was perfect. So, yeah, they were out there, I think, within 20 minutes or so and uh, starting to collect the, the, the return capsule. They also collect samples of all the all the sand and, 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 the, and the soil and things and the plants um, that were there. This is all kind of contamination control for us. It was then taken from there to a, I got some fluff in my mouth, um, from there to a uh, kind of temporary clean look room that had been built um, just in, in Utah, um, for the first night, and they did some processing work there. And then on the Monday, they flew it down from Utah to um, to Houston um, in Texas, um, where it got transported to the Johnson Space Center. Uh, it went, got into the Johnson Space Center, and they basically there they built um, a new curation facility. So it was a whole clean lab um, with a beautiful kind of, a bit like the glove box I showed you earlier, but much, much bigger. Uh, and that's where the sample, um, uh, the taxam went immediately. As soon as it got to, to Houston, it was put into this really clean, really inert environment. So it never saw the terrestrial um, atmosphere at all. And so this is you know, this picture here shows the inside of that that um, that glove box that they've got built. This is where your arms and things go in. And, and this is the taxam head. So so I was fortunate enough to actually be there, not not in the clean lab itself, but in the room next door, watching on a live feed um, as they lifted off the the lid here uh, and revealed the taxam. Um, in here. And so I don't know how well it shows up, but this is absolutely coated in fine black powder. And all around here is really, really basically just asteroid dirt covering this, this, the, the lid of the tax, the, the lid of the the, um, the container and, and covering the tax out. And all around the edges of here, there was just asteroid material absolutely everywhere. Um, we couldn't, I mean, we knew it was going to, well, we were hoping it was going to be coating everything. You saw when they did the collection, there was powder and things thrown everywhere. So we, we knew it was going to be a bit messy and it, it kind of shook around in the um, 
as it came through the atmosphere and things. So we, we knew there was there was likely to be lots of this powder um, available, but to actually see it as it opens up, you know, after waiting you know, tens of years for this was was an amazing experience. Um, this is just a close up, so hopefully you can see this is the tag Sam here. You can see the the kind of dark, grubby surface where all this powder is, and and it gone all the way because of the shaking. It all moved around. This is this is where the lid um, is sealed, so you can see it's gone to the edges here. So the curation team spent several days sweeping up very carefully. You're doing this in these the clean look suit on. Um, you've got your hands through these big in these big rubber gloves, um, trying to work, and this is. Um, very small amounts of powder that yes, they're sweeping up and collecting. It's very, very noisy in the clean lab. So you can't really talk to each other. There's a whole team of people who, who work in there. And it's mainly kind of nods and winks and putting your thumb up and doing OK signs and stuff to actually get this. It's really painstaking work. Um, but they did an amazing job uh, collecting all this material off the surface. Once they've done that, they then flipped the tag SAM over. Um, and this is what you can see here. This is the surf This is the surface I showed you in that image. This is the bit that touched Bennu. Um, these are these contact pads. Uh, and then there's this, um, this is the stone that I was talking about that got wedged in there that was leaving a little gap for material to come out. So you could actually see this this this, uh, this annoying little stone. Um, turned out to be really useful because actually what happened is that some of these screws, they spoke, this lid is supposed, the front part is supposed to lift off so they can ac access inside the tag sam. Um, but two of these screws had kind of cold fused in space so they couldn't just take this thing off um, but because there was this little hole they were able to get most of the sample out um, without having to do the, the, the screws so in total they've got uh, just over 121 grams of material so the mission requirement was uh, about 60 grams or a minimum of 60 grams um, they've got double of that so this is it's all now been taken out of the tax and is in what these these are called the pizza trays. Um, so the biggest particle is about four centimeters or so in size. So it doesn't sound like an awful lot, um, but but honestly, if they'd have brought back, you know, half a gram of material, I think that would have kept most of us busy um, for a long time. So with 120 grams is way more than we could would ever have hoped for. Uh, so the reason I was there um, was that NASA and then the and the Cyrus Rex team. Um, uh, wanted to do what they called a quick look, a, a very, very first uh, early analysis of those samples that they could tell the world about, um, take some pictures uh, and give a kind of, there's, there's 200 or so of us on the analysis team. So they wanted to provide some context and some information as, as they started to pick out samples and allocate them to, to different scientists around the world. And so, so this was the quick look team that assembled in, at JSC in, in Houston as those samples arrived back. And we got given material from from that that powder that was on the outside of the tag sam i think we got it on the wednesday after or tuesday or wednesday after it come came back um so really really quick um we did the very first measurements on on Bennu. so this is one of the first pictures that was taken um so it's this is a scale bar down here this is 250 microns so these some of these bigger ones are maybe a millimeter or so um and it's really really dark it doesn't come across so so well in in uh in these pictures but when you see it by eye these are really really dark and then there's a few speckly things in there that i'll, I'll talk about in just a second and you might also see there's a little white particle which I'll, I'll come back to as well um so the reason i was there is is i do a measurement called x-ray diffraction so i use x-rays to try uh, and identify which minerals are in the sample very quickly um, and also calculate roughly how much of each of those phases are in there um, so this is really noisy, um, not important for you to take away all the information, but, but really the point was that, that we we did this measurement and we could see very quickly that about 80%, 90% of the rock uh, are these clays or these phyllosilicate type minerals. And so um, these are the minerals that have the OH and the H2O bound within their structure. So these formed through water rock reactions. So you probably had um, ices that melted, that produced some liquid water, that reacted with some rocks to produce these clay-like minerals um, really early on uh, in Bennu's parent body. And then there's a whole load of other minerals like magnetite. Um, there's these cal calcite as well, those carbonate minerals that we saw in those veins, um, the iron sulfides as well. These are all minerals that precipitated out of fluids um, during those water rock reactions. The carbonates are really interesting because you can actually date exactly when that happened. Um, you can use radioactive decay and radioactive elements um, to estimate uh, the exact time. And that's some work that's ongoing at the moment, but you can calculate or, or estimate exactly when those water rock reactions were happening uh, within Benny. Uh, and then these are some pictures. So um, these are taken using an electron microscope. Um, so uh, these are on little, they take those little millimeter type particles and we can kind of image them 
it's also the nanometer resolution. So these are, this one's 10 micron scale bar. This is about five microns, this is three. So up here, this is these, these kind of blocky grains in here. Um, these are those carbonate minerals that I was talking about. Um, so these are things like calcite uh, and dolomite that precipitate out, precipitated out of fluids. Uh, and then this, these, these brighter ones here, are, these are magnetites. These are magnetite platelets. Um, and this has then got, within these layers, this is kind of a stack, lots of plates stacked on top of each other. And within between those, you can see phyllosilicate type minerals. We see magnetite in all sorts of different morphologies. So these are magnetite framboids. Um, this is some framboids here. They have little etched pits. So it looks like these things precipitated out of the fluid and then fluid continued to attack uh, and actually etch away at these things. So aqueous alteration, these water rock reactions didn't just completely stop at one point. Um, and then that white particle. So uh, this is a, again an ele electron microscope image of one of those white particles. Um, and actually, we thought at the time when we saw it that it was some sort of contaminant um, uh, that was within the sample. Um, we've since discovered, and we still don't know exactly which mineral it is, but it, we know it's a, a magnesium sodium rich phosphate. Uh, and you can see it here. Sometimes it occurs as these kind of individual particles. Sometimes it's a kind of coating um, on the surface of some of these, um, excuse me, some of these grains like this one here, where it looks like it's kind of, you had two grains that were like this and there was a vein and it's split and you, you kind, of, kind of got a coating on both sides. Uh, yeah, ma magnesium phosphate is really, really rare in our meteorite collections. We, we don't see it very often at all. Um, and when we do see it, we normally see it in iron meteorites that come from big melted asteroids. We don't see it in these carbonaceous type asteroids. Um, so we're still working on exactly how this formed and, and why it's in there. Um, but it's certainly telling us something about the, the composition of the fluids on Bennu um, in the early solar system, but maybe a bit different to what we're used to seeing in our, our carbonaceous um, chondrite uh, meteorites. And then the other thing people are really interested in, um, so I'm not an organic chemist, so I'm not going to dig myself a massive hole talking about organic species, but the Bennu samples contain about 5 weight percent carbon. So that's what gives them that really, really dark colour. Um, some of that carbon is in those carbonate minerals that I was talking about. Some of that carbon is in um, things that we, what we call pre-solar grains. So this is dust that formed before our solar system even existed. So it's, it's older than 4.6 billion years old. Uh, we can use it to learn about stars that existed before our sun. Um, but actually most of the carbon, most of that 5% carbon is in organic species. Um, so, so this isn't life, um, but it's complex carbon bonding with things like nitrogen and oxygen, hydrogen. And we know we've got lots of phosphorus from those phosphate minerals as well. Um, so just as an example, this is a, a Bennu particle that's been pressed. And then this is a uh, map collected using ultraviolet radiation. And all these really bright spots that you can see in here <clears throat> are carbonaceous, carbon-rich um, materials, organic type materials that are, that are reacting with the UV um, light. So, so it is really, really rich in carbon uh, and carbonaceous organic type phases. And there are things like amino acids and all the building blocks. You don't have life, but all the stuff, all the proteins or the building blocks of proteins and the building blocks for DNA uh, are being detected in these um, samples. So it's still very early days that, that there's a whole team of people who are doing organic um, analysis. Uh, I think the first papers on the organics will probably be out maybe in a few months or so, they're, they're, they're coming to the end of that first stage of the analysis. Um, but really exciting results. They are seeing all sorts of fun stuff in there that they maybe don't always or, or can't easily interpret in our in, in our meteorite records because um, because of the terrestrial contamination, which we know we don't have for these Bennu samples. Okay, so that's a good point for me to, to stop, um, but hopefully I've, I've, hopefully I've convinced you that, th that these carbonaceous asteroids, these C-type asteroids are kind of crucial for understanding what the composition of the solar system was and understanding the kind of ingredients for our solar system. You know, what was there? How did it come together to start making planets? And in particularly, in particular, how did we end up with things like water um, uh, and organic species here on, on Earth and, and places like Mars potentially, and also um, Venus and Mercury? Uh, we could do that using meteorites a little bit, um, but we really need sample return missions that can get us samples from a known object, give us that geological context, but also maintain them as pristine materials and make sure they don't react and get contaminated in the terrestrial environment. And so OSIRIS-REx was really designed to go to a carbonaceous asteroid where we thought there was going to be lots of carbon-rich um, phases. We thought there were going to be lots of hydrated minerals uh, and things like organic molecules. And, and what we've been able to do, certainly in the first initial phase of the kind of sample analysis um, towards the end of last year is confirm we, we got the right asteroid, we have the right materials, 
Um, we've got a lot of those materials. We've got 121 grams or so to play with now. Um, and so those things are all, well, yeah, they're all over the world. As I said, there are about 200 of us on the team. Uh, and I can tell you, there's lots of stuff I can't tell, tell you about at the moment, but there's lots of um, exciting results that will be coming out um, in the next few months or so. Yeah, I will stop there and, and happy to take any questions. Ashley, thank you very much. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Of course. That's great. Uh, what a very interesting talk. And uh, I'm sure there are questions. So I shall uh, just remind people, if you're online, will you put up a digital hand, please? Uh, people in the room, try to attract my attention in the usual way. So uh, we've got uh, Mick Nichols. Mick, online. Hi, uh, um, thanks for the talk. Um, when we do these um, space missions, and it comes to the end of that mission, uh, we give some thought as to what we do with the spacecraft because we don't want to contaminate any moons or anything like that. Was this the other way? Did anybody think, oh, hang on, what happens if we bring a virus back to Earth? <laughs> um, so, well, so this one, the spacecraft itself has gone on to another mission, actually. So it's going, it's going to, it's, it's become, it's changed from Osiris Rex to Osiris Apophis. So it's going to go and do a flyby of, a, of another asteroid. Um, yeah, so bringing stuff back to Earth. There is a whole idea called planetary protection um, that is designed to think about bringing samples back from places in the solar system and how they might contaminate the Earth. For Bennu, because it's a small airless body, there is no risk that we're bringing back a virus or any, there's no life there. There's nothing that can can possibly cause us any problems at all. Um, so we for, for Bennu and other asteroid sample return, it, we, it's not, planetary protection is, is not something we worry about. Um, it's a big deal for Mars sample return, which is the thing next on the, on the horizon for us, because Mars is a planet-sized object that, that doesn't really have any atmosphere today and, and doesn't really support life, um, or at least we don't think it supports life today. But certainly four and a half billion years ago, it looks like conditions may have been favourable for, for life. So there is some risk there. And so when those samples come back, there will be a whole protocol and a whole separate curation facility built and designed for those samples. It's going to be those samples will be, come back and they're going to have a team of scientists who are very excited to get their hands on them. And I think it's going to take a long time before they, they're not going to be able to just give samples to people after two days, like we had for ben, for Benny. So, but yeah, it is, it, uh, yeah, it's something that people, and, and it's, it's, it's thought about. Thank you. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you, Mick. Uh, Loss in the room. Thank you very much for that. Ashley, did I hear you correctly when you, you were talking about the death rate, obviously, um, kept, uh, the capsule open a little bit, and and you believe that would allow some material to have escaped. Do you know how much material may have escaped? Because if you collected one hundred and sixty-one grams, just how much could you have perceivably have collected? Um, so that's a good question. So, so the the, the taxan was designed to hold up to about two kilos. So, so, so 60, yeah, so 60 grams was the minimum requirement for the mission. Um, but they, you know, if it all went really, really well, they could have had potentially two kilos. Um, how much they actually collected uh, is really difficult to know. They, so the original plan was um, to, uh, the, the reason they were actually were imaging the thing that the, the tags I'm head at the time was because they were going to spin the spacecraft. And they'd done that without any sample, and they can do it with the sample. And the, and the, and the difference can basically let you calculate how much sample they had in the collection head, which is which what the original plan was. But because they saw the material flowing out of it, they just had to, to cancel that. They just needed to stow it as quickly as they possibly could. Um, so they gave up on that. So we didn't know exactly how much was coming back. They just, you saw the picture, that that, that was as good as the camera image was. Um, Based off of that, they did estimate that they thought there was going to be 250 grams of material in the taxam when they opened up, and we've only got 120. So it's difficult to know exactly how much was in there and how much was lost. Yeah. And definitely that did actually sort of go open a little bit. It was, was that an advantage? Was it slightly bigger than expected? Is that why it caused a foul on the head? 
Sorry, I missed the beginning of that. Apologies. So, so obviously it found closing the mechanism. Uh, was that unexpected? Was the sample a little bit too big? And if it is, is that advantageous to you when sort of doing analysis on it? Um. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah. They did a lot of testing of the of the of the. Uh, a lot of the testing was designed for this kind of sandy beach, but they did do testing for bigger particles because it, it 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 it. I can't remember the exact size. There was a cutoff above a certain size that they couldn't. They wouldn't have been able to collect the particles. They wouldn't be able to get them in. Um. The fact that this thing got wedged in between the sort of the the, the gasket and the and the thing was. I, I just don't think it had ever happened in any of the in any of the kind of preparations. So so it was a surprise. Um, and yeah, the, the thing with the sample size is that because it shook around and these are very, very fragile, um, uh, they are you basically, if you, yeah, they're very difficult to handle because they crumble. They're very friable materials. So you, you saw in the video, it shook around and, and it made a nice landing, but it did land and then it got flown down. So, so the particles, we are really interested in the particle size distribution. But these things have been broken, probably broken down. They were probably bigger particles when they were collected, and they've now broken down into lots and lots of smaller particles and, and powders and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I yeah we we've lost material. Um, we got we got hundred honestly one hundred and twenty one grams is 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 is, um, is more than I mean it's several careers worth of material to analyze. So, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mike's column. Um, I believe they found bits of Mars on Earth, and Ben was in the same kind of orbit as Earth. How confident are you that your primitive material hasn't been contaminated by ejecta from Mars? Well, so yeah, it's not in, in, it's not impossible. Uh, it's so so yes, we have Martian meteorites. There's about out of those seventy odd thousand, there's about two hundred or so meteorites that uh, come from Mars. Um, so the Earth is a much bigger target than Bennu's 500 meters across. So the chance of something hitting Bennu and, uh, is, is pretty small, but not impossible. And then uh, Bennu is, is, the Bennu samples are 80% clays, phyllosilicate minerals. Excuse me, Martian rocks, Martian meteorites tend to be basalts. So they're olivine pyroxene rich rocks, um, not too dissimilar to the Vesta rocks as well. So if we came across a piece of basalt in the Bennu samples, we would be very excited. That would point towards it being a, a xenolithic material that's been mixed in. And there's a whole load of measurements that we can do that could identify these things as being from Mars rather than from Vesta or another, another body. They have different chemical signatures. Um, so interestingly, what your question is kind of related to, to the next sample return mission that, that's not launched yet, but is, is planned is a mission called MMX. This is a, a JAXA mission. And it's going to go to the Martian moon Phobos. And part of the reason for going for Phobos is that it's really dark. It looks a bit like a, an asteroid like Bennu. Um, but also they think there might be bits of Mars mixed into the surface of Phobos. So they can do that. Uh, that can, they can build that spacecraft and do that mission much quicker and before they can do direct sam Mars sample return. Um, so, yeah, for Bennu, it's, it's not impossible, but I think it's unlikely we're going to find a bit of Mars. Thank you. Uh, so, what I want to say is, when I was alive, uh, asteroids and comets were all very different objects in the sky. As time has gone on, we kind of blur the difference between comets and asteroids. From what from your samples of that in your door, do the, the, the samples identify what's asteroid and asteroid or what's comet, cometary, or are they all very similar? Uh, well, so it's, yeah, we don't have any samples, not direct sample. Well, that's not quite true. So, um, so there's been one sample return mission to a comet. Called, uh, that was the Stardust mission that went to Will Two back in 2006, um, but it collected the dust that was coming off in the tail, um, and then it and it was because it comes off at sort of six kilometers per second. So it was in these kind of uh collector spongy bricks um which slows the material down but it melts it and modifies it um but and they're very very tiny like it's i mean it's i couldn't yeah the matter they're tiny grains they're sort of micron sized particles so so uh, human hair is about 100 microns these are smaller particles we have we have a very small amount of material so it's very difficult to compare that to 120 grams of of bennu um so 
But it's likely that that Bennu, because Bennu probably formed in the outer part of the solar system and, and comets will have formed in the outer part of the solar system. So it's likely they accreted similar reservoirs of material. Um, and then they're, they're but but their water rock ratios, the comets were a bit further out, so they probably had more ice than, than something like Bennu. But it's yeah, it's one of the things we don't know particularly well. Well, we don't know at all, basically. And, and it's one of the things we'd like to know is 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 how are bodies like Bennu related to comets? Uh, and and I and places like the icy moons as well, um, which are interesting. So yeah, we'd like a. I would like lots of us in the community would like a proper comet sample return where we 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 scoop up ice and dust from the surface rather than getting stuff from the from the tail. Um. Tony, very nice. You were saying about a lifetime sample. What what is it? The smallest sample size that will give you lifetimes of science. Oh, good question. So, um, so the previous uh, sample return mission was Hayabusa two, which was the JAXA mission, which went to a, a different C type asteroid called Ryugu. Uh, that mission brought back five grams of material in twenty, just before Winchcombe, actually twenty twenty one, the end of twenty twenty, end of twenty twenty. It was, uh, yeah, it's about five grams, and I mean <laughs> that if we, yeah, that's plenty. That's more than enough. Us, we, we've looked at a very, very small fraction of that in the last uh, four years or so, and there's still lots and lots of science coming out of that five grams. The mission before that, um, Hayabusa, didn't work as well as it, it, it should have done, and it, it collected maybe a thousand or so sort of micron, tens of microns particles. And again, that collection is still being worked on today. We, we, we have instruments that are capable of doing very high resolution, very sensitive measurements if we yeah we want more sample it makes our life easier but if we have to work on small samples and small amounts of sample we're very good at doing that okay then so when you're doing your sample testing is there such a thing as a non-destructive or, or a destructive test yeah we we do so um and so we do this for sample return and, and for our meteorites as well we we do as much so it depends on what scientific question you're trying to answer because that dictates what information you want to try and get out of your sample and then that dictates what analytical measurement or instrument you might use but but normally particularly for sample we term we try and maximize the amount of science we can do from each particle or each grain so that means we will do as many non-destructive measurements as we can first before we get to the destructive things so i i we might do we might we can put it in an electron microscope and that's non-destructive and we can put it on a ct scanner and look at the interior and that's non-destructive and um and we can do something like an infrared spectrometry measurement and look at the light reflecting off that's all non-destructive but if i want to know what the the isotopic composition is i need to destroy it so we'll try and do all of those measurements in an order uh, we'll have a kind of analytical work for, and that's a lot of what we've been doing for the last in kind of we knew these samples were coming back so a lot of the years building up to this is is developing these these workflows for the analysis teams where we go right it makes sense to do this measurement first and then this measurement and then this measurement before we do this one where we destroy it all so um yeah it's all very carefully we see it in a lot of meetings it's very carefully planned out <laughs> okay Toby, yeah, thank you i'm looking around for questions uh while people are thinking i've got one myself is there any way of telling uh, how many times the Beno sample has been through a stellar cycle? Oh, um, so what we will, I mean, I, I won't do it, it's not my, 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 my measurement, but we will try and estimate how long it's been on the surface of Bennu, the rock. We And we do that through... Um, cosmic ray spallation basically so that when it's on the surface and there's, there's no atmosphere to protect it so it's interacting with the sun and galactic cosmic rays and things and that can cause slight shifts uh in the isotopic compositions and and so we'll be people will be measuring those to see if we can estimate the kind of um duration of of the the sample that particular bit of sample having been sat within the regolith so the, the, the regolith is a mixture of stuff that would have been uh 
probably samples the interior of the body and also the outer part of the body. And as it got smashed up and mixed together, you, you're getting a bit of everything. So so there might be particles in there that have never really been at the regolith for very long and some that have been there for, for millions or billions of years. Um, the asteroid itself is is 4.6 billion years old. So that's how many... Yeah, I, think, I guess the next question is, yeah. the asteroid might be 4.6 billion years old. Yeah. How old is the material? The, the material is 4.6... Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be four point six billion years old. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Things happened very very quickly in the early solar system. We don't, I don't, I can't tell you the dates for the carbonate minerals and stuff yet, but they're going to be, you know, a bit slightly within a few million years after four point six billion years. Okay, uh, Peter Lloyd. Yes, I, thank you very much, Ashley, for a fascinating talk. Um, I, I'm interested in the. The structure of Benno as a whole, you, you presented uh, excellent evidence that, that the outer surface at least is contaminated with material that's uh, come in from somewhere else that was probably differentiated and maybe had water on the surface. But did I get that right? Um, so we, we there are there are boulders that look very consistent with. Um, with we were talking about Mars as an example, but they, they look very consistent with being bits of Vesta. Um, so so stuff that was knocked off of the surface of Vesta. So bits would be knocked off Vesta at some yeah. stage. Yeah, so basically uh, bits Because of I was thinking movement. about the, the way in which we believe planets form from accumulation of smaller parts. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't you actually expect small asteroids to be piles of rubble? Because there's not enough gravity to fuse the bits together and they haven't got hot enough to melt and wouldn't you just expect them to be a little pile of rubbish yeah 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 yes um yeah so and some of them are i mean we've only visited 20 asteroids or something out of that out of those millions so we don't really have a good feel for for what the kind of interior structure of asteroids are um yeah there's good evidence that so so things like bennu and and ryugu as well are very small um and uh so you wouldn't expect to have say a hydrothermal system operating in those but clearly Bennu there's those veins and we know from the samples now it formed the rocks there formed through a hydrothermal system so no. to do that you needed to have a bigger parent body for that to have it doesn't have to be a planet-sized body but it has to be bigger um so right. they have to have come from a, an original body but that doesn't mean you can't have things that form there will be asteroids out there and and the small ones are the ones we don't detect they're the ones we really don't we haven't visited we don't know anything about um so so yes it's very likely that there are things that are kind of primitive or primordial rubble piley type structures to them as well i mean obviously you, you don't know what the middle of it looks like mm -hmm. but, yeah yeah um, uh, the only two I've seen are this one and um, the, the I can't remember the name. The one they crashed a, a spacecraft oh, into, no, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they look really very similar. They're both they do, yeah, yeah. rubble, you know. Yeah. And, and I can't remember what the sequence com was. Their composition and their mineralogy are completely different. Oh, are they? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. So, so dark, dark. Uh, it's a, it's an S type, a stony type asteroid. Um, so they're much rockier than they are. They are the rock itself is. Oh, longer than than the Bennu type samples, yeah. yeah. Didn't realize that, yeah. But yeah, they do look similar anyway. But there are, if you go and look at things like Itakawa, which is another asteroid that we have samples of, that looks completely different. The shape right. of it is very different. It looks more like a potato. If you know some of those pictures of things in the Kuiper Belt and what New Horizons have seen, it looks more like that. So we the, right. the, the we really don't have a good understanding, particularly things like accretion. It's all modeling. Uh, it's very difficult to get a kind of direct lab measurement of how accretion worked. Um, we we have ideas about how it happened, but we don't really understand it at all, I don't think so. Oh, well, thank you. I, I've got a second rather more mundane <laughs> question. Um, if, a meteorite, if a meteorite lands in my back garden, who mm -hmm. owns it? Who owns it? Yes. Oh, that... <laughs> Does it belong <laughs> to the person oh. whose land it lands? Or... Yes, so we... We work, yeah, there's a whole thing. Um, so we work under, so it, so honestly, in the UK, there is no legal framework. That's what we've discovered. Oh, really? It has been discussed in Parliament many, many years ago, but it's not something that really happens very often or regularly enough for anyone to, be, <laughs> to want to force through. So we work on it being the landowner. It belongs to the landowner. 
That's, that's how I, I was thinking of that poor guy in Winscombe who's had his driveway damaged by this thing landing on it. And I thought, well, if he, if he at least he owns the thing, maybe he could get a bit of a return by selling it to get his driveway repaired. So, they, um, so yeah, so the Wilcock family, whose driveway it landed on, um, actually donated all of the sample to the museum. <laughs> they, it was amazing so I, they have been as i could do a whole separate talk about winchcombe they, they've been uh, amazing to work with we actually have the driveway in the museum oh, uh, really? it didn't really so Winch, winchcombe is very soft okay so you gave so, him a new drive so you gave a piece of sorry i was just you you gave him a new driveway did you uh, yes, yeah, yes, yes. The impact site is only a very small dent, but you can see the kind of the black powder still on the driveway. And um, yeah, so we had it cut out and they've had it refilled in and they've actually put a plaque um, where, where it landed. So, uh, oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah. But no, they 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 were the main people, but but stones were found. So you, what happens with most meteorite falls, are you get a strewn field, an area where, where you get several pieces landing. Um, so stones, so they had the main the main mass landed on their driveway. But several pieces were found by people in the area, and, and all of them were donated to the museum. And they, they didn't have to do that at all. Um, so it was. It was really I don't incredible. think I could resist keeping one tiny little piece. Yes, but... uh, there were a few little bits that they've been kept, but 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 most yeah. of the sample was at the museum, which is which was amazing for us. So um, yeah. that's good. Okay. okay, thank you. Last question. Okay, uh, when you were showing the uh, <clears throat> images of the surface. The actual regolith actually look quite, um, I don't know what the technical term is, but sharp. It, was that unexpected? It, it's as if there's been no surface ablation at all. If we see images of the lunar surface, that's often smooth and dusty. Mm -hmm. and not like the comet, which look very sharp, angular mm -hmm. material. The, um, the, the boulders are surprisingly angular yes particularly because the material is so soft um it, it, they, they really are and and i didn't show any pictures but the, the the lots of the um lots of the samples the bigger particles are also very angular um, there are particles in this that we have it or stones in the samples that almost look like columnar joints it's really amazing um and it's a bit of a something we're thinking about how exactly that formed and why it looks like that it's, it's really interesting it's obviously telling us about the, the strain or the fatigue and the breakdown of the rocks on the surface and so the team the remote sensing team have done some analysis of the boulders on the surface of, of, of Bennu to try and understand that and our job now and the sample analysis team is to try and relate the sample properties to that to see if we can understand what's going on um, but yeah it's very angular Ryugu was the same very angular boulders but we only had a few grams of samples, so we didn't quite appreciate that the, the and we only had very small samples. Whereas with Benny, we've got these bigger stones where we can see these angular shapes. Um, yeah, the, it's a good spot. Don't know exactly the answer yet, but it's something we're working on. And with that, I think uh, we need to give uh, Ashley a big max for the Sweden Astronomical Society. Thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you very much, Ashley. No problem at all. Thanks for having me.